of AAPT. The AAPT Alpha Award recognizes outstanding work in the development of an advanced laboratory apparatus or experiment by an undergraduate physics student in their home institution within the United States. National recognition of these projects encourages their proliferation and helps to build the next generation of experimental physicists and educators. The award is only conferred if the work by the student or of students is of exceptional quality, worthy of a national award comparable to the honor received by undergraduate students for research through the American Physical Society's APCA Award. This award, the AAPT Alpha Award, was established in 2014 via an idea presented by TeachSpin to AAPT and Alpha and is generously funded by TeachSpin for five years. And if you haven't been to TeachSpin's truck, you missed out. I think they're shutting down soon. Um, but it was a wonderful demo um, uh, truck to have over here in the exhibit hall. As an AAPT Alpha awardee, each student is receiving a plaque travel expenses to come to this uh, AAPT national meeting, and a cash honorarium of $4,000. Each student also receives a half hour invited talk in that meeting, which is what you're going to hear soon. And the faculty supervisors receive a citation and travel expenses to the same meeting. The AAPT Alpha Award Committee has announced the first two recipients of the award. Brandon Thacker from California State University Chico to receive the award for 2015 and Ryan Scott, Rochester Institute of Technology, to receive the award for 2016. So at this point, I would like to invite Jonathan Reichert and Barbara Wolf Reichert of TeachSpin up to the stage, as well as Eric Ayers, who is the uh, faculty advisor for Brandon Thacker, also to come to the stage. Brandon Thacker can't be with us today. I'll let Eric tell you why. Uh, Brandon Thacker, under the guidance of faculty supervisor Dr. Eric Ayers, is recognized for his project on the mechanical chaos, chaotic oscillator. Brandon developed this advanced laboratory experiment at Cal State Chico, and the project was selected for the 2015 AAPT Alpha Award. So on behalf of for Brandon, congratulations. <laughs> And then we're gonna go ahead and invite up uh, Ryan Scott and Edwin Hawk to the stage. Ryan Scott, under the guidance of faculty supervisors Edwin Hawk III and Stefan Priebel, is recognized for his project on the Hong O Mandel effect. Ryan developed this advanced laboratory experiment at the Rochester Institute of Technology. This project was selected for the 2016 AAPT Alpha Award. Congratulations. So at this time, we're going to have Eric come up and uh, provide a talk on behalf of Brandon. It'll be about 20 minutes. We'll have time for questions, and then Ryan will come up and give his talk afterwards. Okay, I'm Eric Ayers, and uh, Brandon unfortunately couldn't be here. He asked me to convey his sincere gratitude to Alpha and to AAPT for the award. He has some good reasons, three of them, for not being there. Now, this is Brandon, so you know if you ever run into him. Uh, reason number one is uh, Michael. Reason number two, Madison. And reason number three arrived just a couple of weeks ago. That's Nolan. Uh, Brandon, since uh, graduating from Chico, has dedicated or taken his physics degree and applied it to studies of superposition issues, domains, forces, generalized optimization problems, lots of chaos, and more fluid dynamics than is taught in the undergraduate curriculum. Uh, his wife works full-time, he works full-time at home. 
But our goal, and this is, this is what I threw at Brandon to, to say, hey, look, this is something we would like to do to, to replace. This is, many of you will recognize this, the Datalon Chaotic Oscillator from uh, about 1990. I remember it because I was trying to get one for my institution as an undergraduate, and at $2,000 in 1990 money, they couldn't afford it. And then I got to Chico and discovered in a back closet they did have one there, but you know it had been a, you know at least two or three years intervening between those, and uh, that one required an ISA connection on a computer and uh, run Windows 3.1, neither of which are available anymore. And so I suggested to Brandon that he try to make something that could replace this in functionality. The design parameters we worked with, we wanted something that was low cost, open source, so anyone could build their own, undergraduate level construction, and all parameters needed to be adjustable by the user as much as possible. And the goal was to accurately generate multiple Poincaré sections so we could put together a movie of how the Poincaré sections evolved through the cycle and uh, get some more insight into chaos in that. So uh, the system we used was cross magnetic fields with a rotating dipole in the middle. The horizontal field there, the green arrows, represents an oscillating magnetic field. The dipole is in the middle. It's rotating on an axis coming out of the screen. The fixed magnetic field merely provides a reference point. You can run it, and it'll do chaotic oscillation without that. But that gives a, an idea of which direction down is. Where's the equilibrium point? And we can, of course, control all of those fields. Uh, the equation of motion is there on the top. And uh, parameters are given there. If you simplify that equation of motion a little bit by uh, putting in some other variables, you get this. And uh, if you uh, take out the driving term beta there, you recognize that's just the damped pendulum. So this is a sideways pendulum where instead of gravitational field, you can set the gravitational field strength by putting in that constant force. Um, if that worked, we would get something just like this, just a damped harmonic oscillation. That's without any drive signal. And as anyone can tell you, without a drive signal, pendulums are just not fun. <laughs> so we had several options for this. One possibility is to drive the pendulum with a function generator. We could look at the sync output, and every time the sync output came around, that would give us one Poincaré section. We wanted hundreds of Poincaré sections. Uh, I suppose we could have divided it up somehow, but we looked at other possibilities. Uh, I tend to grab an Arduino anytime there's a problem of any kind in the lab, but the Arduino is rather limited for this one. It doesn't make a good uh, analog output trying to drive a sine wave with an Arduino. It's just, it doesn't work well. Um, we thought maybe an Arduino with an external digital to analog converter, and that works, but you're really, at that point, if you want to track the position of the thing and communicate with the computer and everything else, you're running out of space in the Arduino, running out of processing power. Uh, I was eventually introduced to the Teensy 3.1 specifically, and that one really just made this work. That, and so I passed this on to Brandon. It is a Cortex M4 running at 96 megahertz, uh, built-in 12-bit D to A converter on it, uh, built-in USB conversion, costs $18, so it costs less than an Arduino and does about four times more than the Arduino, and uh, that had enough processing power to do all of this. So uh, not quite done yet, just having the processor isn't enough. Uh, the processor puts out an A to D signal that goes from 0 to 3.3 volts. Sorry, D to A signal, 0 to 3.3 volts. And you do want something that goes plus or minus around 0. You also, of course, want to be able to drive a Helmholtz coil, which you can't do with a microcontroller, not more than once. And so this circuit provides a uh, difference amplifier. They are circled. 
And that difference amplifier then just subtracts off half of the reference voltage, the 3.3 volts that the microcontroller is running off of. So that changes your signal to plus or minus 1.65 volts. We send that signal into a uh, class B amplifier, which uh, has a little bit of gain down there at the bottom. Gain was chosen so that this moves 1.6 volts to 10 volts. So now we have plus or minus 10 volts. And with those power MOSFETs there, we can now drive this at up to 5 amps. Fortunately, the coil we use doesn't need 5 amps because I don't trust the specs on those. Uh, we also wanted to uh, actually track the position of the oscillator in real time. So we have inputs for quadrature inputs on the, uh, from the rotary motion sensor. Originally started with a PASCO rotary motion sensor. It doesn't have enough uh, resolution for what we wanted, though. And just because, well, we added blinky lights and extra outputs in case we ever thought of something we would do with them. At the moment, one of the blinky lights tells you if communications is working right. The other two tell you if the oscillator is going, and uh, one of them blinks every time the oscillator crosses the zero position. Uh, we wired that all up onto a board designed with Eagle CAD and sent this out to be processed. And let me tell you, this is a great time to be a nerd. Not only do you have this kind of microprocessor available, I mean, that's more computing power than I had in high school, and it's on a postage stamp, and uh, you can send out boards like this, and two weeks later, you've got a perfect printed board, it's ready to go, and then you find out it's wrong, and you make another one. We also have laser cutters nowadays and 3D printers, so you can take your design, if you want coils, you just make concentric circles, or not concentric circles, but different sizes of circles. You stack them together, you bolt them together. The bolt holes are cut already. You don't even have to get a drill press out. You bolt them together and you wind them up and there's your coils. And you can make them any shape you want, so you can make them interlocking and have actually a nice looking apparatus. At least I kind of thought so, and Brandon was happy with it. So the shaft there in the middle, um, yeah, you really can't see well in this one. And I can't see anything because there's a spotlight on me. But uh, there's a brass shaft down the middle. We had every part on the thing non-magnetic except for the magnet down the middle. Here's a better picture of what's going on there. You can see the actual dipole there held in place by a little three uh, 3D printed object. The larger coils that you're looking at, where you're looking down the axis, that's the field coils that tell you which way's the equilibrium position. And the uh, horizontal uh, axis coil, uh, sorry, left to right axis coil there is the drive coil. And so we plug that into a function generator first and it spins things around. We were real happy with that. Next, we had to do a fair amount of programming. We wanted to go from just, not just have an apparatus, but to have an actual instrument. So you could plug this into a computer, communicate with it like you could communicate with you know, a nice function generator or a nice scope, and have that give the data to the computer directly. So Teensy is possible to do that, or capable of doing that. It has USB communications built in. It can track the quadrature encoder for the rotary motion sensor, uh, calculate the velocity in real time, while synthesizing the sine wave. Now we did the sine wave with just a lookup table, 256 points on the lookup table, and all the uh, Teensy has to do is count microseconds. And every number, or every X microseconds, it's time to update the sine wave again. It updates the sine wave, it uh, measures the position, actually looks at what the position is. The quadrature detectors are taking care of that already, or the teensy is watching them on the side. And then it calculates the velocity, the position, and sends those out the uh, USB line to the computer. So it does all of that just fine. It works. And here it is with the drive off. And we get exactly what we expected, because this is the same graph that I showed you earlier. But either way, it's exactly what we expected. Now. Usually in chaos, we look at phase diagrams. So the first thing that we did was just look at a
graph velocity versus angular position and just have it swing back and forth. This is just simple harmonic motion at this point and it makes an oval, okay? This is what we call a period one motion. It takes one period to complete the complete cycle. So uh, that's boring. Change the frequency, change the amplitude, you get more complicated motion, okay? Uh, yeah. You'll notice on all of these graphs, and I should explain this now, there's a little bit of a stripe down the middle, right at zero velocity. The reason for that is this is, we only have uh, 1,016 with this particular quadrature encoder, 1,016 points. And the way we were calculating it, when the velocity becomes close to zero, it, you tend to not move or not observe a motion before the next report goes, and so it reports that as zero. So velocities close to zero kind of snap to zero on this. And we later changed the resolution and got rid of that little problem. But here's this motion, an actual video of it. Hope it works. Oh, good, it works. So um, not your standard pendulum there. As you change the frequency and amplitude some more, you can, yeah, there we go. You get more and more complicated things. I skipped over more than I expected there, but yeah, they're pretty. You can just say ooh and ah and stuff, kind of like a fireworks show. Uh, this one's really interesting because you can look at that corner. Do I have a pointer? I don't have a pointer here. So look on the far left side where things are kind of looping up. So you can see at the very bottom or far left, there's like a little arch. The, the motion there is it's, a pro, it's going one direction and it approaches zero, okay? Oh, thank you. And of course, I'm gonna shake more than you want. But right there, it comes in, it approaches zero and moves off to another part of the orbit. The next cycle around, it approaches zero much more closely, then it actually touches zero, then it goes past, goes the opposite direction briefly. That's what that first loop there is. Goes to the opposite, the next cycle, goes opposite direction even more, even more, and then finally abandons that path at all and goes on somewhere else. This kind of uh, behavior is typical of chaotic systems and they, it's why they get chaotic because it can go either way from that point. Uh, this one was really interesting because if you think about that, that's a pendulum swinging around the top, okay? I don't have a video, it was going like this. I'll make a complete fool of myself here. So, over the top, back, over the top, back, like this. So, um, kind of intriguing motion. All of the communication is just through a ser serial port we were reading everything with Python programming and pat plotting it in matplotlib. You could do uh, anything, basically, that can communicate with a serial port, can communicate with this instrument, and including LabVIEW, for example. You can plot it any which way you want. Here's a polar plot. You can see where it's, it goes around and stops, goes around and stops. That's a completely different motion. And this right here is what we were really kind of looking for. We wanted to see a bifurcation. So this is where it goes from a, a period one motion where it's just swinging repeatedly to a period two motion. It now takes two drive cycles to complete the motion. Chaotic systems go in that sort of bifurcation. They go period two, period four, period eight. The rate at which they double increases and of course the doubling increases. And so very soon you go from period two to period uh, whatever that is, okay? Um, Chaotic isn't random, it's a long period repeatable motion. In this case, the period of the motion might be longer than the age of Brandon. So, now to analyze this, I've talked about Poincaré sections. A Poincaré section is a snapshot of position and velocity at one point in the drive cycle. So here you look at all of, in blue there, that is all of the positions and velocity it had in, I think, a thousand, uh, complete drive cycles, all of the positions and velocity it had at the beginning of the drive cycle, at point zero, 
on the Poincaré section. And then you get rid of the, uh, the rest of the motion and you just look at that Poincaré slice. And now this thing is reporting every, or 256 times per drive cycle, so that's 256 Poincaré sections. You stack them together and turn them into a video. The left hand here is a computational model of the same equation. The right hand is raw data. And I've got this on loop, so you can watch it till you're bored. So that was our goal being met. We actually built something that can do everything we wanted and does Poincaré sections and uh, makes sense as much as chaos does. We'd like to particularly thank the CSU physics alumni. We started with Brandon. Brandon was our very first what we call physics summer research institute student. Uh, one student. And we got an alumni to donate $3,000 for his summer salary. I donated my time because I tend to spend all summer in the lab anyway. And that was three summers ago. Uh, no, two, two summers ago. This is still summer. And uh, last summer we had five students and now this summer we have 17. It's really getting out of hand. It's great. We love it. Uh, students have a local summer research program that they can do. It gives them some experience that then they can put on their resume. We try to get them to do it between their sophomore and junior year, get some experience on their resume, and then they can do an REU between their uh, junior and senior year. Uh, for those of you faculty who are less interested in chaos and more interested in getting summer research, please talk to me. I think this is a wonderful program, and I got some suggestions on how to start your own. All, uh, let's see, other people to thank Bill Koperwatz, a local technician, and Jonathan Newport, who introduced me to the Teensy, and of course, Alpha, the Advanced Lab Physics Association. Since Brandon graduated, we keep developing it and tweaking it, trying to make it better. We have a new circuit board now, and uh, our latest iteration, much more compact and easier to put together, and the whole thing interlocks like Legos now. Uh, we put tape on it to make sure it doesn't fall apart, but it's there and all held together in uh, one piece now, and works pretty well. If you are interested, I have flash drive with everything you need to know to make your own, all the parts, AutoCAD drawings, 3D printing stuff, you name it. Come talk to me, find me. I'm here till tomorrow afternoon. And thank you very much. Thanks again for the award. Have you guys thought about um, how you might extend this to uh, helping general undergraduate students study chaos? Uh, I've used this in advanced lab. I teach advanced lab oh, okay. at Chico State, and uh, this is now one of the options for an experiment that people can do in cool. advanced lab. So yeah, we used it last school year, uh, last fall for the first time, and it's on the list for this fall as well. So starting with the flash drive, about how long would you estimate it would take to recreate? Well, um, Alpha's shown more interest in this project than is reasonable, in my opinion. But uh, they got me to do an immersion in it this year. And uh, we did a two and a half day immersion where people came to Chico. I say people. It was one person. Chaos isn't all that interesting, I guess compared to single photons. But one person came, and the two of us built that one and his, which he took home with him at the end, in two and a half days. Um, I pre-ordered the circuit boards, and uh, the I didn't talk about the flywheel and the damping on the top, but I made the flywheels on the lathe ahead of time, too, because that's just you know sitting there in the lathe for an hour or two. Thanks. If TeachSpin wants to manufacture this and put it on the market, come talk to me. Yeah. Come, come talk to me. You know how to get a hold of me. And yeah, I'm interested. So. 
had a, a mechanical uh, chaotic pendulum, which I think was based on some work by someone from a school in Florida. Did, yes. Did, did you consider that instead of, I mean, it, or, or, did, or did you, and if you did, why did you choose this instead of that method? Well, Bob DeSirio's Chaos Pendulum in Florida does very much the same thing, does a great job with it. And I looked closely at what he does and decided I wanted something that was a little bit more self-contained and uh, had higher resolution. Uh, current resolution on this, by the way, is 4,096 uh, steps in position resolution per, re per revolution. And so it's very good. We get very nice, clean data from it now. Um, the other bias, this personal bias on my part, my senior thesis as an undergraduate was a compass needle in an oscillating magnetic field, just looking at one point as it went past. And um, so I, I kind of liked this one and kind of nudged Brandon that way. Very nice the lecture. I was going to mention that you say that sometimes pendulums can be boring, and indeed they are. But I was going to show you this is another uh, that I brought it actually for one of the talks. There is a candle, but candle can can. Uh, so if you put a, a stick through a candle through the center of the candle, mm -hmm. so, so and then you can balance the candle, and then you can burn it from both ends. Mm -hmm. So it's going to start dripping wax, but one is going to wax a little bit more than the other one. So so it's not going to be exact, right? So one is going to tilt a little bit more. So the one that tilts the more because the flame is always perpendicular, the heavier one is going to lose weight faster than the lighter one, so it's going to oscillate. So it basically becomes an oscillator, but uh, friction, friction actually damps it. So, but if you put it a little bit kind of like with a, a, a bar bearing, so there's almost no friction, then it actually becomes chaotic, as you were saying. The oscillates can go this way and then comes back the other way. So it Excellent. becomes a very simple oscillator uh, that you can actually measure periodic orbits. Like, like you were saying, you can measure the track, the, the, the dynamics of one of the points in time, and you can measure then the, uh, the, the periodic orbits, and, and, and the Lepino exponent is positive, too. Oh, thank you. So, I saw your apparatus at the, at the, oh, the apparatus yeah, so competition, the, uh, and yes. it's very nice. Yeah, thank you. So, so I was thinking, I mean, one of the things I wanted to try, but maybe I mean, would like to nice, is, is to try to do a similar thing, but with, with, a, with an Arduino. Because an Arduino you can have with a sensor, and then the Arduino can try to, because it's very hard to calculate, as, as simple as this is, mm -hmm. calculate the, the, the center of mass, how the, the, the wax is being dropped as a function of angle. It's as a function of angle and velocity. So it's very complicated to calculate the, this equation. But maybe without an Arduino, it would be an actually a nicer thing to, uh, to Let's do. talk afterwards. So it would be nice to talk, yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll have a quick. Oh, sorry. We'll have a quick transition of computers, and then Ryan Scott will talk about his apparatus. God, the color! If you don't pay attention, let me just log in real quickly. And this. Right. Oh, it's on. Can everybody hear me? Yeah? Good. Great. Okay. Um, so first of all, I guess I would like to say thank you very much to AAPT for having me here. It's, I've had a great time here. I've been here for, since Sunday. Um, and I've learned a lot. There were a lot of very interesting talks. Um, I really appreciated it. Um, and thank you for giving me this award. I'm very flattered, quite frankly. Um, I worked really hard on this project, and I'm, I'm glad that's going recognized, honestly. Um, so let's just get into it. Um, so I feel like everyone here understands how hard quantum mechanics is, and also everyone here understands that there are a lot of concepts in quantum mechanics that make quantum mechanics very challenging. Um, and because of those things, it makes it very, very hard in my general experience with my fellow classmates to grapple with quantum mechanics, what it means, how to deal with it, how, 
<laughs> excuse me, sorry, how to analyze quantum systems. Um, and so I think that one way that we can come about um, analyzing this particular problem of helping undergraduates understand um, how quantum mechanics works is through hands-on experience. Um, and so when I was working on my senior project um, and I was made aware of this particular award, I felt like it would be a very good thing for me to try and turn this laboratory experiment into something that an undergraduate could uh, hopefully understand. Um, so I guess I just want to talk to you a little bit about how I'm going to go about this. So I, I, I'm sort of just hashing out my thoughts for you guys as I, as I go forward because I figured this is an AAPT meeting, so you guys are interested in knowing um, how to present information, physics information, to undergraduate students in a meaningful way, or maybe even high school students, um, or graduate students, I don't know. Um, but anyways, as far as I can tell, the, basically the way that this thing works is like, we're interested in like a very broad problem of like, how do we present information, physics information, to our undergraduates? And then nested in that is each discipline that you're interested in, particularly for me, I'm interested in quantum mechanics. So like, how do we present meaningful quantum mechanical information to our students so that they can understand what they need to do in order to analyze quantum systems? Um, and then nested in that particular problem is the specific problem of this experiment. So I'm going to try and guide our eye in this way. Um, so hopefully we have a little bit more context. Um, so in terms of the general problem, what I'm interested in asking are, are questions like, what information should we be, uh, be presenting? How do we present that information effectively? How do we present that information in such a way that it's not too hard or not too easy for the students? How do we, um, what do we assume about the students that are interacting with our information so that we know that the information that we're giving them, they'll be excited to engage with? Um, and also, how do we present this information in an intuitive way? And like, that's like the core for me, because if quantum mechanics is anything, it's certainly not intuitive. So it would be really nice if we could give them a way of thinking about it that is uh, graspable. So like, really what I'm interested in giving them are abstract tools or principles of thought. Um, and this last line here that I wrote, I really, really like the fact that like, I really want to come at this problem from like, um, the theory informs the experiment, and the experiment validates the theory. So we have like an intermingling. Like we don't neglect one or the other. We really think about this as a holistic perspective. So uh, to do that, what we have to do is basically boil down quantum mechanics to something very, very simple so that we can focus on one of the core principles of quantum mechanics in order to effectively present it to our undergraduates. So the thing that I came up with was essentially that quantum mechanics is basically classical mechanics with superposition. It's a little bit more complicated than that, of course. But really, really, you can boil it down this far and get really far. Um, and I really like that quote by Feynman, that superposition is the only mystery. It's really great. Um, I really think that, that that does justice to the, to the subject. Um, so an ideal experiment that we would have would be one that demonstrates superposition easily in a theoretical way so that the students can easily work out the details. Also, so that the concepts aren't overwhelming, so they don't feel lost in the sauce, is one of my <laughs> all-time favorite professors would say, and that it produces directly measurable results so that we can see that, okay, look, I'm writing this down on a piece of paper, on a whiteboard, or whatever. I see that this should be the outcome. I go into the laboratory. I take data. This data says this exact thing. I can calculate them. It's crazy, right? Because if you can get them to think in this holistic perspective, then they really understand what's going on, hopefully. <laughs> so um, the particular application that I was interested in was the Hong Kong Mandel effect. Now, the reason why this is such a useful and effectual um, experiment to focus on, I think, is because the crux of it is superposition. I mean, there's also entanglement in there, but like a, entanglement's basically superposition, right? Just like another, another level, but it doesn't matter. The point is, is that it's easy to show that superposition yields direct measurable consequences in the Hong Kong Mandel um, experiment. Now, of course, the question is, well, what is the experiment? So like, let's look at the design. So basically, it starts out all the way over there on the left. That is an abstract diagram of what the actual experiment is. You basically have a black box photon generator. What the photon generator does is it puts out um, a pair of photons for every incident photon that comes in. right? And um, we did this experiment collinearly. So basically, that means it was all in one dimension. I know I haven't drawn as two, but that's so you guys can see. But basically, you have to imagine this as all happening on a line. So basically what happens is this photon generator puts out two photons that have the same exact frequency. There are one, there's one photon 
that has some frequency omega that's polarized vertically, and then you have one photon that has the same exact frequency, frequency excuse me, that's polarized uh, vertically, or horizontally, the opposite of the one that I said. Um, and anyways, so then after that, what we, what we, so let me just take a step back. So what we can really control in this experiment are two things. How far away the photons are from each other, and also what their polarizations are in space. So using those two things, we have to be able to construct something that shows superposition, basically. Right? So what I have there is some delay, and the delay controls the separation between the photons, and I'll get into how that works. Um, and then we have a half-wave plate, which basically rotates the polarization. So effectively what we have here are two pieces of uh, equipment that lets us control those things um, in a discrete or analog manner. The delay is discrete because every single slab that you put in is finite. But the half-wave plate, you can rotate. So you basically have a continuous control there. Then after that, what you do is, uh, you, so you rotate those into a um, uh, plus-minus basis. Oh, shoot, I don't know how many of you guys know quantum optics. Um, <laughs> But anyways, the point is that you rotate them into such a, in, in such a way that when you measure them at a thing which measures horizontal and vertical polarization, they're effectively indistinguishable. And consequently, what you do is you monitor the counts of vertical and horizontal polarized photons at the output of that thing. And then you cross-correlate those things. So you say, do I get clicks at both detectors or do I only get clicks at one or the other detector? So, um, I'm gonna like try and sketch out like what my approach to the theory would be if I were presenting this to undergraduate students because I think that that would be useful for you guys to think along with. Um, and you guys can analyze whether or not you think it's meaningful or not. So basically the way that I come out this is, okay, so based on the technical theory of the situation, you can effectively think about um, each photon basically as a little sphere of light. Now it's not exactly technically correct, but for the purposes of this experiment, you can do that. Right? And that's really good because that means the students have like a graspable analogy for the photon. They can think, okay, I have like a little white ball or a little red ball or something like that. Right? And so that means that they can like think about, okay, like I know that when I have a particle in classical mechanics, I can locate it in space using some sort of um, coordinate system. So you can effectively do the same thing here. The only difference is that this thing only moves at the speed of light and it only contains energy. It doesn't have rest mass. Right? So the only things that we're controlling about these little spheres are how many photons are in each sphere and what the intrinsic polarization of that sphere is. Like some, you know, it's like, okay, I have like some horizontal or vertical polarization in the sphere. It's like an abstract concept, doesn't really matter. Like if they shine light through like a polarizer, they can get a grasp of what polarization is. The other thing that I think is really, really important for them to understand um, is ba the basics of what eigenvalues and eigenfunctions are. So they need to understand that like, okay, if I have a system that satisfies the time independent Schrodinger equation, every single time I measure the energy, I always get the same value back. But then like you can generalize that with them and you can say like, okay, every time I measure the polarization of this particular photon, I get horizontal. So then they like get a feeling for like, okay, like an eigenvalue is something that stays constant for the particular system as long as we don't change anything. So then they can really start to realize like, okay, my everyday experience is essentially fraught with eigenvalues. Like my entire experience is just eigenvalues. Um, because we can't touch superposition, we can't deal with it because it's a, we're dealing with classical worlds, we're dealing with classical mechanics, right? So you can show them, like you can have them work it out, you can make them do it in the lab, I don't know, but basically you can take a photon, you can shoot it out there, and at the polarizing beam splitter, you can sit there and you can monitor the counts. You say every single photon that you measure there, there's one photon, and it has some polarization, in this case it would be horizontal. So that means that you know that that situation is what we call an eigenstate or an eigenfunction. This photon, this phenomenon satisfies this. So like, it gives them a grasp of like, okay, I'm having this experience that we call this abstract thing. Excuse me. So then the next thing that they really need to be able to understand is generally what superposition is in the abstract, right? So they have this idea of, okay, if I have a photon and it goes through one way, that's corresponding to what we call an eigenfunction. So then you can do the same thing if you reflect it. That thing is also going to correspond to an eigenfunction. You're going to collapse it down to the state where you have, okay, I have one photon, but this time it's vertically polarized. And so effectively, what you have in the classical, in the uh, quantum world is a superposition of classical states 
each with a probability of occurring one half. So basically you're thinking about it as, okay, I have this phenomenon occurring plus this phenomenon occurring with some probability. So then like, they can really think about their experience with the apparatus and say like, okay, like I'm in some sense actually dealing with the quantum world, at least hopefully. So then on to this thing. So being able to use those, two, those, I, those core concepts, they should be able to effectively deal with this system, hopefully. So uh, for technical reasons, you end up getting that this system, since it's two photons, you end up with a product of wave functions instead of just a single thing, but that doesn't really matter. The point is, is that you write it that way. Uh, so the things, when I write psi at t equals zero, what I mean is during the delay, this, the photon state that you have is one is horizontally polarized, one is vertically polarized. And you pass it through the delay so that they basically overlap. At psi of T1, what I mean by that is between the half wave plate and the PBS, the HWP and the PBS. In there, you now are rotated by 45 degrees polarization. So we label it in that way. But there's an important thing here, right? And this is going to seem like it comes down from the heavens, basically. It's just like in math proofs, where <laughs> you end up with this plus minus thing. But like people, uh, if you get enough familiarity with the system, you eventually think like, oh, like if I just rotate to the plus minus basis, I can kill off the terms that I want to make go away. Um, so, but like you basically introduce this substitution here. And then you end up, if you take that substitution, you plug it back in, you distribute out the terms, you get this really gross looking thing at the bottom. But it's very useful because it ends up uh, allowing us to say, hey, like these two terms here, if we could only get rid of the A's and B's, we could actually make this thing go away. And we could show superposition if we can measure the state. So if we make the photons overlap, because they have the same frequency, because they're the same number, we can basically make the assertion that labeling them at distinct points in space no longer matters because they're in the same region. So that means that 1h, 1v is equal to 1v, 1h. 1h, 1h is equal to 2h, and 1v, 1v is equal to 2v. So we get rid of those labels, and the thing we end up with is 2h minus 2v down there. So you have two photons at the left detector or two photons at the right detector, each occurring with probability a half. So you get rid of the, the cross terms. So you say, oh, this is a very interesting thing. Now, if only we could show it in experience. So we go and we set up this system that looks like this on the left here. Um, you can see the laser. I wish I had a pointer. OK. So you can see here that you have all the way up here at the top left, there's the laser. It shoots through a bunch of filtering. It goes through the photon black box there. Oh, thank you. OK. And it comes out of this. And then it comes into this. Then we have a bunch of other filtering stuff. And all this stuff is doing is basically just making sure that the frequencies are the same. Then it goes into, um, OK, so this is an old setup, but that's all right. Uh, so there would be some delay here. And then this is the half wave plate. So those two things let us control where the photons are relative to each other and also um, what the polarization is. Then here's the PBS here, and that basically lets us direct where the photons are going, and then we have our detectors there. And off in the other laboratory, there was a thing um, that basically let us watch whether or not both were firing or only if one or the other was firing. Okay, so these are the constituent pieces. You can see the laser. Um, this thing here is called um, a down conversion crystal. You can, this thing's really amazing. You can control it by temperature, so you can choose which frequencies you want. It's ridiculous. Um, this is the filtering, that's the half wave plate. This is what the uh, um, delay material looked like. It's just crystals. Um, and this is the PBS. Okay, so this is the interesting bit. So uh, this is basically what Hong, Ao, and Mandel showed when they did this experiment in 1987, 1989, something like that. Um, and basically you can see here that, okay, so here the photons are spatially distinct. So what you end up with is that they do get coincidence counts. And the reason is, is because your coincidence counter, our coincidence counter, could only click every 80 microseconds or something like that. Um, and I did the math, and that corresponds to a spatial photonic separation of about uh, two kilometers or something like that. So uh, <laughs> if this separation is a foot, that's definitely one count. 
Um, so as you bring them to overlap like this, because they're spatially smeared out, you create this sort of dip here and you start to march down the dip. And eventually if you get to this point where they're overlapping completely, you basically destroy the counts. So effectively you have data right here that shows you that that quantum state that we wrote down is real. Which like, that's like the thing that I would want to get the undergraduates to realize, say oh my gosh, like it's real, like it's there, right? Because like all we deal with really is like the hydrogen atom and like, well, I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't run around with hydrogen atoms. Just, oh, let me just <laughs> excite these and look at the light that comes out. Um, although we do probably have that experiment. But anyways, so like my whole point here is to basically say that like, I think that this experiment is an ideal candidate for showing undergraduates what superposition is. Um, the mathematics isn't, overwhelming, it's not terrifying. I mean, it, I went through it a little bit quickly, so you'd have to go through it a little bit slower, but it's not like, it's not like oh my god, we're dealing with Dirac notation and f operators and projection and blah, 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 blah. No, like, all the jargon is effectively gone. So it's something that undergraduates can really grasp, hopefully, with some sort of intuitive sense, hopefully. And that, the, the, the measuring of it is, is quite easy. It's not like horrible to set up. The, uh, it depends on how you want to set it up, but it's not like terrible. Um, I think that I had to tear that version down and build a different version, and that only took me about a week. Um, and it's also, I think that, the, that any sort of quantum optic experiment, but like this one in particular, is very, very effective at giving us feeling for like the abstract tools that we need for dealing with. Um, quantum mechanics, like just any sort of, um, just I have a photon, I'm passing it through some beam splitter, I'm shooting it here, shooting it there. It's very easy to think about versus like I have an atomic state, like what the heck is, does that mean? So there are my references. And I would like to give a big thanks to my advisor here, Ed Hawk, and also my other advisor back at RIT, Stefan Preble. Um, Linda Barton and Ben Zwickel were huge helps. Um, Dr. Barton was very amazing in that she let me know about this award, and Ben was awesome in helping me communicate with the Alpha folks, and he did a really good job just keeping me up to date on how things were going. Um, RIT Phys School of Physics and Astronomy, of course, if it weren't for them, I wouldn't have been able to do this experiment in the first place, and as usual, AAPT for having this whole meeting. So, questions? Sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good question. The, so the question was, um, if a student had just the basic components, um, but it wasn't set up for them, how long would it take them? Uh, it took me about a week to build it myself. Um, so building it, I don't think that you, so it depends on what your lab schedule looks like. If you have a two week lab schedule, it probably would be too much to ask them to build the whole thing. But it probably wouldn't be too much to ask them to um, align the beams, put in the filtering, put in the half-wave plate, put in the delay. So like if you make the photon black box for them and just have that set up and then tweak the knobs a little bit so that the, the beam line is out of line and then have the PBS set up already, it's pretty straightforward to get them to um, align the beam to the detectors. Which I think that, that was a pretty good experiment. Uh, so, yeah. Did you have a question? No? Oh, sorry. I, sorry, you, yeah. I thought you raised your hand. <laughs> yeah? Can you tell me what you might do with circularly polarized photons instead of a vertical or horizontal? Yeah. Um, so, trade secret, polarization is really just angular momentum, and you can write horizontal and vertical polarizations as superpositions of plus and minus circularly polarized light. Um, so you could probably do something similar. I mean, I haven't thought about that too hard, but yeah, you could definitely probably do something similar. Oh, uh, for those in the audience, the question was, what could you do with circularly polarized light instead of horizontal and vertical?
I'm just going to leave this right here. All right. Thank you all for coming. We'll call the session to a close.